The last thing John notes about these locusts is that they have a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit. And as we talked about at the beginning of chapter 9, is this the same being as the star that's fallen from heaven? Um, you know, I don't know that we necessarily have to, uh, to say that they're the same being. If they are, why not stay with the star motif? Right? They have, you know, the, the star fallen from heaven, or somehow make clear that they're the same being. But the names of this angel of the bottomless pit are very telling. In Hebrew, the name of this being is Abad, which means destruction. But the name in Greek, uh, and we'll come back to Job here in a second, the name in Greek is Apollyon, or destroyer. So there's that destruction. Abaddon is a word that's used a couple of times in uh, the Old Testament. Let's look at two passages. First, uh, if somebody would read for us Job chapter 26 and verse 6, and if somebody else would get Proverbs 15 and verse 11. Job 26, 6 and Proverbs 15, 11. Okay, go ahead and go ahead and read that one. Sheol and Hebron lie open before the Lord. How much more the hearts of the children of men? Okay, and then somebody's got Job chapter 26. Verse 6. Yes, verse 6. Naked is Sheol and Formid and Abaddon and Abaddon. So, and these, there's a couple other places we could pull from the Old Testament. In both of these places, Abaddon is connected with what? Sheol. What's Sheol? Death. Not quite dead. Yeah, the, essentially Sheol is the Hebrew word for the unseen realm of the dead. When, when people die, they go to Sheol. And so Abaddon, the term Abaddon or destruction, is connected with the realm of the dead. And so death and destruction, two very closely intertwined forces. Which tells us that by, by its very nature, I mean, if, if the angel of the bottomless pit is named the destroyer, you know right, these things are, their nature is destruction. Of course, being paired with Sheol, Sheol can, can connected to the destruction of human life. Now, of course, people are a lot there existing there, but life has been destroyed. And so, a plague of destruction. There's kind of the, the terror of demonic forces here. Right? The, they're coming out of the bottomless pit. And they have, you know, the, the, pierce, the, the being releasing them is a fallen star. The, the ruler is known as the destroyer. So there's a lot of kind of demonic things connected with these locusts. But they're also connected with, or they also bear uh, the symbols of cavalry, of an invading army. And so the idea here is this, you know, this kind of destructive force that God is going to release on uh, humanity. And, and probably the two forces working together, human armies and demonic beings. But, for the purposes of Revelation, they've been melded into one image, the image of locusts. Right? So it says locusts, so we shouldn't think that it's prophesying there'll be a plague of locusts. It's prophesying destruction right? and using locusts as an image because people would have understood what locusts do. Well, similar types of things are what awaits those people that refuse to repent. We turn from the sounding of the fifth trumpet 
to the sixth trump. And so there's a suggestion here that what's happening here is something different. But there are a lot of elements that are very similar. And there's, so it's distinct, but there's, there's certainly some ways in which uh, there's some similarity here as well. The first woe has passed, John says in verse 12. Now remember, this is evoking chapter 8, verse 13. The eagle that flies in midair and, and calls out, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. And so each of these is a woe. Well, the first woe or the first calamity has to do with the locust. Now we come to the second one. Now here in the second one, there's a lot of confusing things going on here. And, and a lot of things where you're following along, okay, I got, I got in, and then something changes and something's different and uh, throws you off a little bit. When the sixth angel sounds, John hears a voice. Now, notice up to this point, a lot of times of what, what's been occurring when things happen, right, the opening of the seals, the blowing of the trumpets, John's been seeing things, certainly hearing things as well, but when the sixth angel sounds, he hears a voice. Now, where's this voice coming from? The the voice is coming from the four horns of the altar, the golden altar, before God. We've seen this altar before. This is the altar under which the souls are crying out, How long, O Lord, holding true, will you not judge and avenge our blood on those that inhabit the earth? It's also the altar from which the angel gets coals to put in his censer to throw down to earth at the beginning of chapter 8. So we've seen this altar before, but this time, a voice comes out. Whose voice is this? <coughs> is it God's? <laughs> I mean, that might be the first thing we think of. Um, now, may, maybe, maybe not, because it says, the four, the four hundred golden all over before God but maybe it's God's voice. What, what other possibilities are there? Maybe it's the Lamb, maybe it's Christ's voice. They're in control, right? I mean, it speaks with authority. Um, so it's, it could be God's voice, it could be Christ's voice, it could be an angelic voice speaking on behalf of God or Jesus. So ultimately, we can't necessarily pinpoint the voice, but we know the source of the order. God is the source of the order. And what's the order? Release the angels. Anybody else think of release the Kraken? <laughs> yeah, I know. No, 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 no Kraken here. Um, something much worse. And release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Now, the river Euphrates in the first century served as the boundary, the eastern boundary of the Roman Empire. And so, again, there's that play on that, the fears of what's outside the boundary. But what's this about four angels bound to the river Euphrates? What's that all about? Once again, we kind of have this, John kind of throws this out here, and we don't really have something else to go on in the sense of, oh yeah, we know about this because Jesus talked about it, or we know about this because Paul talked about it. Just like the four angels that stand at the four corners holding back the four winds that we saw at the beginning of chapter 7. And some people have said, oh, they're the same. Right? The four, you know, back in chapter 7, the four angels cause the winds not to blow until the people are sealed. And so they say, okay, it's the same group. They say, well, they were at the four corners of the earth. These four are the river Euphrates. Yes, well, it's a vision. Don't push it too far. Right? It doesn't have to be, you know, logically uh, oriented. But 
here are these four angels bound at the great river Euphrates. So once again, I think we have to ask, are these the good guys or are these the bad guys? What do you think? Yeah, the fact that they're, <laughs> I mean, that certainly doesn't sound like a, <laughs> a good thing. But on the other hand, uh, God's angel, one of God's angels destroyed 185,000 Assyrians in the book of 1 Kings. So, okay, well. But yeah, I mean, it doesn't, it immediately kind of sounds like, oh, uh, it's not somebody had one meeting it's anywhere. It's going to be a big stretch, but um, at the end of the Euphrates, um, it's going to be the Garden of Eden. So it could be the angels who were keeping power. Um, and you know, but that's a very, you know, that's a very inter interesting thought, right? The Euphrates, of course, very one of those rivers coming out of the garden, and once Adam and Eve were cast out, cherubim were established to prevent them from coming back in. So maybe that's, these, these are who those are. What does the fact that they're bound mean? To me, it almost indicates like a form of punishment. Like, it, when I think of the angels, I think they can go back and forth almost from heaven to earth as messengers or even demons uh, want to be on earth because it's better than where they came from in hell. But both of them can go back and forth to some degree. But these angels are stuck on earth. And I don't know. Yeah, I mean, in one sense we could, we could say, okay, if they're good, then they have been established at this, stay here at this post, right? And so you're bound to this post in this, this region because we need you at this point. But on the other hand, we, when we think of binding, we think of like shackled or in chains or something like that. Uh, Second Peter, uh, talking about the fallen angels, the angels that uh, did not uphold their first estate, uh, is the way the phrase is used. Um, Verse 4 of Second Peter chapter 2. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of deepest darkness to be kept until the judgment. All right? So maybe that's what it's talking about here. The, the binding being kind of like they're chains. There, there's a punishment there. What's going to even further confuse us is what happens when they're released. And we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, so the command comes for the sixth angel to release these other angels. Which is, this is really the first time where we've seen in one of the seven trumpets the angel actually doing something related to the sounding, right? So it's usually been the sounding and then John sees the great mountain falling into the sea on fire, right? But now he sounds, he hears this voice, Release the angels, the sixth angel goes and releases them. But note what it says then after that. The four angels were released who had been held ready for the day, the month, and the year. It's almost as if what's being suggested here is it's God has been preparing for this exact time, whatever time that is. The, the, the time when the sixth angel sounds these angels have been prepared, positioned, held there for that time. Now, what's the time? Is it, you know, God's been waiting for the right time for this to take place? Is it related to chapter 6? You know, the, the, the souls under the altar are told, take a white robe, wait until the number of your brothers and sisters has been fulfilled. So now is that time, but whatever it might mean, this is what these angels have been waiting for. And their purpose is to kill a third of mankind, to kill a third of men. Here again, you know, I probably at this point don't need to remind you 
but uh, it's especially important with the next number we'll see, that numbers in Revelation are symbolic, so it's not like we could calculate whether, whether we're thinking about this at, at the, the end, which I think is what, or thinking about this as something in the past, um, or even for those of you that might hold the futures position, you know, you can't take the total of humanity at either of those times and say a third of them are going to die. The idea is sizable, it's partial, not total. 